Alright guys, we are um, currently here at the site of where uh, Winter Quarters Mine was. Uh, so Winter Quarters Mine is the name of the mine um, that served the Schofield community. Um, so it's referred to as a Schofield Mine. Um, here's some of the ruins that's available here. I'm going to walk down to the house that's um, just down the way. It's in pretty cool uh, condition right now, but I'm just going to tell you a little bit about um, the disaster that happened here. Um, so, so Schofield is um, kind of in the central part of Utah. They found coal reserves and set up a coal mine here. It really helped to grow the Schofield community to quite, quite a size, actually. It was, it was big in its prime. Um, the, uh, obviously the draw for coal was fully monetary and it brought with it a whole lot of, uh, people from all parts of the world. So we had a very diverse community here, um, many of them working directly with the miners. Um, and the, the mine produced real well for a good number of years, um, once the turn of the century hit, um, in fact, it was the year of the turn, so 1900, May 1st, 1900, uh, kind of went down as an infamous day for this part of Utah. It's actually the disaster that occurred on that day is considered the largest mining disaster in the West, definitely in Utah. Um, so it was a really heavy hit, a big deal for everyone who was affected. Um, and obviously just left the mine in shambles. Um, but uh, I'm going to read a story to you and then talk to you a little bit about some of the details of this um, here. So the story I'm going to read, it's actually um, a story given by a William Daniel Walton who um, lived and worked here at the Schofield Mine. So, he shares this tale. He says, At the time of the disaster, I was a boy of 18, living at home with my mother and seven brothers and sisters. Our home was located in a coal mining town in the mountains of Utah, was known as the Walton House, a short order house with a few boarders and mother as general manager. It was May Day, May 1st, 1900. The miners began work at 7 a.m. as usual, but being May Day, they anticipated the celebration, which was to take place in the afternoon. A celebration to most miners meant to spend time in the sunshine and fresh air, or to gather at their favorite saloon. That day, instead of taking my sunshine and fresh air, um, um, or my usual place on the fifth level of the number four mine, I went into the thick underbrush of ravines and quaking aspen trees to look for our milk cow and her new calf. So they were trying to round up the cow so that they could offer something to the festivities going on for May Day. Um, everybody in the community contributed. So um, he's trying to find his cow and, his, and the calf, the newborn calf. To our family, this meant a fresh supply of milk and it, I, I was to find the cow and calf and bring them back home. Mother had packed a lunch for me, as I was not expected home till the late evening. I was happy to be on my way, climbing the trails, enjoying the sunshine and fresh air, and observing the welcomed signs of spring, and at the same time, listening for the tinkle of the bell which we had tied to the cow's neck. So he's listening real close, trying to hear if um, his cow is anywhere nearby. It's got a bell tied around the neck. As I passed over the area, which I la uh, later learned was almost directly above the fifth level of the mine, I felt the earth tremble. I recall wondering to myself what it could be, and I remember looking at my Ingersoll watch, which read 10 o'clock. Not being able to figure out what caused the earth to tremble, I continued on without further thought. Um, I did not arrive home until after dark. As the town came into, into view, I was struck by the unusual activity. The entire town was lighted and nine special railway cars had been left 
on the main line near our home. As I came nearer, I could see that coffee, milk, and sandwiches, along with flowers, were being distributed to the dozens of heart-stricken people I met everywhere. I later found out that the earth tremor, which I felt earlier that morning, was one of the worst coal mining disasters we've recorded. 208 men and boys lost their lives in the dust explosion at the number four mine in Schofield. Our home was a hive of activity. Food was being served and help was being given wherever possible. Instead of the reception, I had expected I was very unceremoniously shoved into the kitchen, um, given a dish towel and told to get busy. My sister Libby managed to give me the bare facts. Our older brother Andrew was in bed, unconscious and not expected to live. I was greatly saddened when I was told that Louis, um, or Louis Lation, a good friend of mine, who had taken my place in the mine that day, was still missing. Miraculously, my brother Andrew regained consciousness, recovered, and gave his account of the explosion. He was a driver on the first level, a driver being one who handles the horse which pulls the empty cars to the miners who in turn blasts the coal loose and loads some 22,000 or 2,200 pounds of coal in each car. These loaded cars were then taken to the main entrance where they were literally dropped down the half mile track to the exit of the um, exit by the electric hoist. He had just taken empty cars to all of his men and was waiting at the switch about a quarter of a mile from the main entrance. Superintendent Thomas Parmley and General Foreman Andrew Hood happened to come along at the same time, making an inspection, an inspection tour. Seconds later, they felt the blast and were almost knocked to their feet, knocked from their feet. They all knew it was a serious explosion, and the superintendent instructed my brother to get word to as many men as possible on his level to hurry out this exit and not the usual way, which would be in the direct path of the explosion. My brother ran two miles through the mine to tell all of the men on his level that what had happened and where to make a safe exit. Um, they were successful in saving the lives of all the men on the first and a few of the men on the second level, but were finally overcome themselves by the after damp, and all of the men on the third, fourth, and fifth levels perished. The term after damp is the term used when the oxygen has been burned out of the air. Dozens of men lost their lives not knowing where the explosion had taken place or where to get out. For there is absolutely no way to communicate with them. The persistent and heroic efforts of the superintendent, General Foreman, and Andrew to save the lives of the miners almost cost their own. Andrew was finally carried home unconscious, and that was the way I found him on my arrival. I went to see Louis Shetlation's mother the next day, and I shall never forget the anguish and sorrow in her eyes as she said, if you had only gone to work, my boy would be alive. I could only weep with her as that was a fact. Her, bro her boy had taken my place. I promised her I would assist in getting his body out as soon as the air pumps had been re replaced. Unfortunately, the mines were very dry and dusty, and very little watering was done to keep down the coal dust which clung to everything about an inch thick. This was especially true on the fifth level where the explosion was believed to have taken place. We still do not know what caused the explosion, but I believe it was started by an open 25 pound keg of black powder, and this was intensified by the accumulation of fine coal dust. After the disaster, many necessary precautions were taken, but this was, the, this was little solace to the widows and orphans of the 208 men who'd perished. Um, so, um, as he explained there, 208 men died. Um, although he, uh, his account talks about the explosion occurring in the fifth level, I think that they have stipulated that, um, in truth, it happened on the fourth, but it, it essentially collapsed both fourth and fifth almost instantaneously. Um, and the only survivors who did make it, and I think there was a group of about um, I want to say close to a hundred men um, who were on the first level and were able to make it out that that second way um, before they were cut off. Um, but as you can tell, 
most of the mining workers for this mine died in this explosion. Um, it really rocked um, the community of Schofield. He talks about the effect that it has on the widows and children. Um, there are numerous stories about what happens to those families, how they end up surviving now that they no longer have anyone to work to make a living for the family. Um, some really gracious gifts were made by people from all communities, uh, from the uh, Catholic representatives who sent a whole bunch of supplies and money, um, from the ZCMI representatives who sent a whole bunch of um, uh, burial clothing and um, resources that way as well. We even have a story of um, a group of children from the communities of Utah who got together and um, filled some, something like three full rail carts full of flowers as um, an effort to memorialize uh, the death of these individuals. It, it had a huge impact on not only Schofield community, but Utah as a whole. It was, it was seen as a, a major tragedy of uh, the turn of the century. So here's that building I was telling you about. It is a very, very interesting ruinous building. Um, I'm not sure what it was, but uh, you can see that it was probably an important town building of some kind. Um, these mining towns always existed real close to the mines themselves. So if you walk up this way, you keep seeing ruins of small buildings along the way, walls and things, and trails that go up either side of the canyon, presumably to entrances to the mine. We didn't um, venture up that way, but um, as you can see, this is basically all that's left of the Schofield mine. It's buildings like this. And it really kind of stands as a testament of, um, it almost memorializes the event itself. Just the level of, um, the ex I guess the extent to which these buildings have um, fallen to ruin, but, um, it would be interesting to find out what this building was for. Um, these days, this is a private property, so this footage is probably footage that you won't be able to see on your own. Um, I don't imagine you'll have much of an opportunity to come see this yourself, but there is a cemetery in Schofield um, that you could visit, and you'd be right close to all of this. but. Um, again, this tragedy is important to see not only uh, so that we get a glimpse of the way the Utah community makes a habit of coming together in times of struggle, but it also highlights the centrality of mining for the Utah economy. It was a major piece of how Utah put itself on the radar for the U.S. in their um, search to really become part of that union of states. So that's about it for this one. Um, catch you later at another location. All right, guys, one last uh, piece of Schofield here. You'll see these dark rounded in memory of tombstones here. Every one of them. May 1st, 1900, May 1st, 1900. Every one of these dark ones, they're all memorialized graves for those who died in the scope of the disaster. You'll notice some of them are grouped by family, so we have brothers and fathers and um, uncles and all of them buried together. You'll see that this is just an endless stream of those who died. Whom we're still placing flowers for, you see, we've got 
we've got people in this community still feeling the impact of the disaster that happened here. It looks like a lot of these have been redone now that I'm looking closer. Because this is one of those same ones. It's definitely a May 1st, 1900. You can't really tell on the camera, but it's worn down. They're probably going to replace it here eventually. But these other ones have been replaced already. It's crazy to just glimpse how many people that is. Impact.